Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back. I'm going to get right back into it because we were in the middle of a unit last time. We were talking about tadpole mortality, and I used this to introduce the first multi level model. This is uh, a binomial model at the top, so I'll run you through it again. S is the number. S sub i is the number of tadpoles that survive in tank i. This is binomial distributed. N sub i is the density of tadpoles that were alive at the beginning of the period of observation. Right? So that's the maximum observable survivors. And P sub i is what we're modeling. We want to make inferences about that. We're going to get a posterior distribution for it. The probability of an individual tadpole in tank i surviving. Uh, we put a logit link on this. Um, and then we attach it to a linear model, in this case the simplest possible linear model. It's just a log odds parameter. And uh, we have a different intercept for each tank. Um, we, we assign them all a, a common prior. This prior is an adaptive prior, a varying intercept prior. Instead of having fixed values inside of it, it has parameters. And so this prior represents inference about the population of tangible things. They have a mean log odds of survivorship alpha across the whole all the tanks. Right? The average tank has a, a mean log odds of survival alpha, and the standard deviation among them is sigma. We're going to learn those values from the data while we're estimating the actual survivorship rates in each tank. And what arises from this magically, not so magically, uh, just logically, actually, is pooling and shrinkage, which is what I was about to explain to you, which is... Uh, Better estimates is why we're interested in it. Um, here's how you fit it in map to stand. If you want to look at the raw stand code for this, which I encourage you to start doing as soon as you start to feel comfortable with this at least, uh, the stand code looks very similar. Uh, th this modeling language I'm teaching you is basically the same, just with different names for densities in a lot of different software packages. So you're learning something that will last you your whole life. <laughs> Absolutely. You are in retirement home running Markov chains. Uh, uh, you will be using similar languages, I, I assume, uh, because this is as close as you can get uh, in algorithmic form to the mathematical definition of the model. Um, any questions about this structure? Yeah? How do we get to where we see the raw scan? Uh, you type scan code and give it the fit uh, map to scan model, and it'll dump it out for you. Yeah, I think in the, in the Markov Chain Monte Carlo chapter, I talk about that, uh, that if you're interested in doing that. You can always get it. It's in there. Because what map to stand does is it just takes that list, it translates it into stand code, and passes it all off to stand. Stand produces a bunch of samples. They come back. I wrap it all up in an R, a nice R object that you can interact with like you're used to interacting with stuff. But all of the components are still in there. And if you do STR on these fit models, like STR M12.2 here, you'll see all the components. There's a bunch of shit in there. Technical terms. <laughs> they call it cruft in programming usually, but it's, it's, it's just programmer language for shit. But uh, no, but it's all in there. The stand code, and it'll spit it out. It's not so different. Um, you'll see a part of it, the model block, looks almost identical to that. Um, okay. Uh, and there are there are model types, which you're not going to be able to define in to stand. So at some point, you might want to uh, do some raw hacking in stand. It's not that hard. Okay, so here's what happens, and this is the slide that I ended on uh, last week. Um, what I'm showing you across the horizontal here are the different tanks. There are 48 tanks in this data set, and uh, on the vertical, I'm showing you the uh, proportion of survival uh, for two different sets of estimates. The blue points are the raw fixed estimates. These are what you get if you just took the number of surviving tadpoles in each tank and divided it by the density of tadpoles originally alive in each tank. It's just the raw empirical survivorship rates. Yeah? And um, uh, then the open points are the posterior means that we get from the multi-level estimates, uh, the alpha sub tanks uh, for each tank. Uh, there are 48 of them. Um, and I'll tell you what that horizontal dash line is in just a second. Uh, first, I want to draw your attention to the phenomenon here is that you see um, there's a gravitational force induced by that dashed line. <laughs> uh, all of the open points have drifted towards it relative to the blue points that they are paired with. Right? So there's two estimates here um, for each tank. One would come from a traditional fixed effects model. Uh, that's what you get the blue estimates. Um, and the open points are the multi-level estimates. And the question is, why are they different and why do they show this pattern that they do? Uh, this pattern is called shrinkage, as you can think of it, is that they have all shrunk towards that horizontal dashed line right, relative to the blue points. Do you see that? 
everybody, just kind of the general uh, attraction to it. But but the pattern of shrinkage here is informative about what's going on. This shrinkage results from uh, the pooling of information across tanks. Uh, the tanks vary in the amount of data that's in them because there are different numbers of tadpoles in them, so there's more and less evidence in different tanks. Um, and when we learn about the whole population, we learn about uh, the likelihood, the, the probability of different intercepts for different tanks because they will be more and less plausible depending on what we learned about the whole population. And this means that we can do better than the raw empirical average for each tank. Uh, that's the pooling thing I explained on Thursday with cafes, right? Remember the cafes issue? Uh, so um, uh, it's not just the data from the Paris Cafe that, that can help you get a good estimate of, of what happens at the Paris Cafe. The data from other cafes also helps you uh, because you're learning about the population and you have a finite sample from the Paris Cafe and you want to augment that with the data from the other cafes. But how much you should augment it depends upon the variation among cafes. And that's what's going on in these models. What's cool about it is the logic of that, exactly how to do it optimally, is taken care of for you. All you have to do in Bayesian inference, uh, this is going to sound weird, it's like all you have to do is build a tank. No, all you have to do is set up the assumptions. Assume there's a population, uh, say you make some parameters for its shape, uh, and then set up the logical relationships uh, between the population and the individual tanks, and then you don't have to be infinitely clever and do the calculus to figure out what goes on, uh, the, the Markov chain does it for you and figures out the implications of the assumptions. And this is, next week when we talk about measurement error, this is gonna be a huge bonus and it's gonna save us a ton of anxiety because you, you don't, means you don't have to be infinitely clever and figure out the implications of your assumptions. Probability theory does it for you. You just have to make the assumptions, right? And if you're like me, your intuitions about probability theory are terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, and it's because you're human, right? Um, and you were not evolved to do probability theory. Uh, uh, so this is a, a huge thing to rely upon. Um, and then, the, of course, the issue is developing intuitions after the fact, schooling your intuitions based upon what the logical implications that arise. And the fact that all of these open points have shrunk towards the horizontal dash line relative to the blue points is a logical implication of the assumptions. Um, and now let's think about why it is and what that means. So the horizontal dash line is the population mean, that's alpha. That's the posterior mean of alpha uh, in the adaptive prior. Um, and I, the red line that I've imposed on here now, this is the raw empirical mean. So if you just take the number of surviving tadpoles across the whole data set and divide that by the number of tadpoles in the whole data set, initially a lot of tadpoles in the whole data set, you get the red line. It's not the same as the posterior mean of alpha. Why? Because some of the tanks have more tadpoles in them than others. So they have, uh, and the ones that are smaller, suffer more sampling variation. They represent less well the population. So if you just average naively across all of the tanks without observing the fact that there's an imbalance in sample size among them, you commit this cardinal sin in biology called pseudo-replication. <laughs> the biologists know about this, it's a horrible word. Uh, 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 it, but the consequence is you make the wrong inference, right? Because there's heterogeneity among the tanks in their survival rates. And so when there's variation and you, and you just treat them as if they were all the same tank, uh, you get the wrong inference about the actual uh, population mean. The population mean is not the raw empirical mean. It's something you must infer in light of all the imbalance and sampling and everything else. And again, yes, this is terrifying. You'd have to be infinitely clever to figure all this out without the aid of, well, probability theory, which does it for you as long as you set up the assumptions. Assume there's a population. Assume that each tank is sampled from that population. And then automatically the probability theory tells you the logical implication of that, which is that the population mean, the statistical population mean among tanks, mean be the raw empirical mean across the whole data set. Does that make some sense? Uh, and so the shrinkage is towards the dashed line and not the red line. Now, it'll often be pretty close. If you have a, a big data set and the data are well balanced, they're going to be pretty close together. But there are cases like this one where they're not so close together, and that's why I like this as a teaching data set. You can just really see the difference between them. Um, in particular, uh, uh, big tanks um, have lower uh, mortality uh, on average. You can kind of see it in the data, right? Uh, the big tadpole tanks have a crowding effect. And so on the left-hand side of this graph, we have tanks with initial small, call them small tanks. They have few tadpoles as the initial density. On the far right, we have large tanks, and there's density dependence. So you get more mortality in the high-density tanks here. Um, and that, 
And if you just do the naive averaging, they have an undue weight on what you think the average, well, the raw average mortality rate in the whole uh, data set is dominated by the big tanks because they're more tentpoles. That's what goes on. And that's why the red line is below uh, the dashed line. Does that make some sense? This is, this is hard to get, so I'm, I'm sympathetic to the fact that this may take you a couple of weeks to actually wrap your head around. Uh, you'll do some homework not fully understanding this, and then it'll come together. That's the first hand I saw. You can also see that the shrinkage is less in the large tanks than in the small as a result of this bigger sample size. Yes, and thank you. I'm gonna get, I got a couple of slides coming up about that. That's exactly where I'm headed next. Other, yeah. So how is the population one generated that it, it didn't have this, um, like, being pulled down by the larger... Isn't it also average for all across tanks? Um, you mean how was uh, the horizontal dash line yeah. inferred? It's not dragged down because um, it's it, because of the parametric structure of the bottle, which is a horrible answer. Uh, but alpha isn't the meaning of that parameter is the average in the statistical population of tanks. And so, if you've got one tank, say you had a population with like exactly two tanks, and one had twice as many tadpoles as the other. Um, so now you want to say, okay, we sampled intercepts from a population, right? So nature sampled mortality rates into these tanks. Uh, each tank only gets one vote in, in, in the inference of the whole population. So you've got to account for the fact that they're imbalanced uh, and not just pool them as if they were all the same, right? So it's sort of like if I'm, if I'm interested in um, – uh, something like speed of mammals, and I've got, uh, I know I need some examples. Uh, weasels and woodpeckers are all over my Twitter feed today, so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've seen 100 copies of that, and Putin was on his back, and I don't know what's happening <laughs> right now. <laughs> but <laughs> some of you don't know what I'm saying, and that, that's just normal. But uh, no, so woodpeckers and weasels have different average locomotor speeds. <laughs> so I'll assert. And if you measure the weasel a bunch, measure a bunch of weasels, uh, you get an estimate for weasels, and you measure a woodpecker just once, um, there's different sampling error variation there uh, in the first place. And if you just took a, so if you pooled all that data and said, what's the average speed of vertebrates, uh, you get a very terrible estimate because your, your estimate would be dominated by the weasel measurements. Right? Is this making some sense? So now, if you wanted to say, on average across vertebrate, what's, what's the average travel speed, you'd want to account for the fact that you've, over, you've got way more data for weasels. And that's what this model does. And it does it because it's, it's, it's estimating the population while it estimates the individual intercepts for each tank. And the individual intercepts for each tank are using the data from that tank, pooled in with a little bit of data from the whole population. And how much, well, there's a formula for it, but I'm not teaching it to you because the model figures it out automatically. But uh, when there's more data in a particular tank, the standard, the error of estimate in that tank is smaller, so you augment it with less data from the population. In tanks that have very few tadpoles, and I'm going to explain this on the next slide, they shrink much more towards the population mean because there's more sampling variation because there are fewer individuals. So you get a less precise estimate from it. Um, there's some examples coming. I've got like four slides coming that are supposed to just unpack that point. Now where it comes. There's another hand, or yeah. Um, I'm just curious with the fact that it's you know, the average survival is high. Um, when you're sampling these things, the intercepts seem to cluster. There's above 80 percent, and then there's below 80 percent. Um, yeah, yeah, and that has to do with the with the covariates that we're not modeling. In the full data set, there are a bunch of covariates, and if you, you take these models and you start adding in the covariates, the experimental treatments, you'll remove a, a lot of this unexplained variation from the population. Well, so the presence and absence of arthropod predators is creating those two clusters uh, yeah. that you're seeing with your naked eye. I guess I, you, I forget they, they were dragonfly larvae, I think they were. Uh, I'm just curious, is it a problem that this is being assumed to be a symmetric distribution? But it's have? not. Remember maximum entropy. When you say the, the distribution, when you, when you say we assign a Gaussian prior to this population, you're not assuming it's symmetric in empirical realization. You're saying I want to estimate its mean invariance, and that's all you're claiming. The only information contained in the Gaussian distribution. And, and this is deeply weird because you tend to like think about its shape as being something about empirical realization, but probability theory is epistemological, not ontological. Uh, it would probably make no sense, and I'm pretty sympathetic to that. But something about like 
an exponential distribution. So say you put an exponential prior on a parameter. Is that a claim that the most plausible thing is zero? No, it's a claim that all the values are greater than zero and they have a mean. And there's no other information in the sense of information theory embodied in that distribution. In a Gaussian, the only information embodied in it is the mean is, and variance. Uh, and you're making no claims about anything additional, actually. It's just that whatever those other moments are, uh, if you don't want to make any claim about them, the most conservative distribution you can use is a symmetric one. But it's not a claim that it's symmetric. So I guess it's, it's not a problem that... Well, it could be a problem. You could probably do better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't... I think what your question is getting at, and uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, I, I may be, is that does that, if we assume that the population is Gaussian, does that force the distribution of these estimates to be Gaussian? It does not. Right, you'll see it. Plot them out. That's not Gaussian around the mean. It's skewed, even on log odds. All right. And in fact, we're only assuming it's Gaussian on log odds, which is way, way different than this. But uh, it, in fact, doesn't. Um, you can easily, they could all be on one side. Uh, well, they can't all be on one side of the mean. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> most of them can be. Uh, and they still make that difference. Because the population parameters are distinct from the others. Yeah. So it's epistemological. And this is a weird thing. It may take you years to kind of like, and you don't even need to ever like become comfortable with this, but it may take years for it to happen. It's probability theory is is always about states of information, uh, and sometimes those states of information make really good predictions about things that arise from sampling, but they need necessarily. And probability theory is is incredibly successful, even in cases where we make crude, crazy assumptions about things. So. I said before, linear regression, the geocentric model of statistics, <laughs> I said before, uh, it's unreasonably successful given how unbelievably bad its assumptions are. I mean, it's, if you read the list of assumptions, like, this is useless. I can never use this same thing. So why is it so damn useful? Because it's just an epistemological claim about if all I care about a measurement is its mean and variance, uh, here's a model to do it, to track the change in mean as a function of predictors. Uh, and it does that job really well. It makes terrible empirical predictions. Uh, in most cases, uh, because it's not a, an ontological model. Does that make some sense? It's tricky. This isn't to say we shouldn't be striving to do better. We should always be striving to do better. It's just saying you don't have to have, there's no single right model. Uh, now we're back to like week one in my philosophical, uh, you know, sermon on the multiplicity is on, is on the horizon here. But um, this is a tricky thing. Uh, it, anyway, is that like half an answer? It's good enough? Yeah. Good enough? Okay. And this is, this is tricky stuff. It took me a long time to wrap my head around this too, because... I had the same, like, decades of scarifyingly bad stats courses as everybody else did. That's sort of like, I want, as I told you at the beginning, I wanted to give you guys the stats course that I always wanted to have but never had, and, and I'm still trying to figure out what that course is. But um, there's this, the way things are usually taught, it's all about sampling distributions of observable frequencies. Uh, but if that was true, then no classical statistical method could actually work because they don't actually predict observable frequencies very well at all. Um, and you can make, you can assign a Gaussian distribution to all kinds of stuff that's not Gaussian and still get really good inferences out of those models. And it's because they're just epistemological maximum entropy devices, is what they are. They're information processing machines. And so they can work even when the assumptions are purely epistemological ones. They're about, here's a machine, it starts with this state of information, these assumptions, what does it learn from the data? Uh, we get advice from them. Anyway, I can try this again on Thursday when it's like sunk in and you've had a glass of wine and thought about this. It's, it's tricky. But you can think back to, what are the, in a maximum entropy sense, uh, what's the information contained in this distribution? And the answer is often really surprising and minimal, right? It's, and then Gaussians are like that. They're funny that way. Um, okay, let me get to shrinkage. Uh, so now we'll get to your thing. Oh, wait, sorry, Bonnie. Um, so would it be accurate to define the, the dotted dash line as being like the dotted line? Yeah. 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 Yes, in the imaginary statistical population, we have inferred. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's not, it's not the empirical average. It's, yeah, but that that sounds right. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't even been drinking it. I'll go with that. That sounds, that sounds fine. It's hard because there's a bunch of averages. It's like when I talk, it's the same thing. You guys ask me questions and I hear myself back. I'm like, oh my god, did I say that? And the you know, thing, you have averages of averages. Uh, later this week, we're going to have a distribution of functions. You're going to love me uh, when we do that. So, okay. Um, yes. All right. So here's the take-home stuff that's, that really makes these models worthwhile. I'm pragmatic like you guys, believe it or not. 
I'm mainly interested in making inferences about nature. And what I want are good estimates. And multi-level models use this pooling uh, to give you better estimates. Shrinkage makes better estimates than the raw empirical mean. And it seems, that seems like a paradox. In fact, I'll show you a little bit. That's called Stein's paradox in statistics. And like most paradoxes, it's just a paradox of intuition. Uh, when the Bayesian model violates your intuition, it's nearly always your intuition that is wrong. <laughs> right? And it could also be a bad model. But if you believe the assumptions and you disagree with the conclusions, then you're the wrong one. Right? Uh, so let's go with the shrinkage and why, and I'll show you that it's better in a moment. Um, you get more shrinkage when, there's, when the tanks are small, when there's less data per cluster. So what I, what I mean is there's more movement of the open points from the blue points when the tank, in the small tanks than in the big tanks on the far right. Uh, why? Because there's less evidence per tank. So if you had a naive posterior distribution, like in a fixed effects model, for each intercept in each tank, you have a bigger standard deviation than it would in the, big, in the larger tanks. There's less certainty there. Uh, so the Bayesian model automatically augments that estimate with more information from the population. And that drags it closer to the grand mean, or the average tadpole in the average tank, as Bonnie said. Does that make sense? Uh, so likewise, um, in the large tanks, there's more evidence. So the posterior standard deviation uh, for that intercept parameter would be smaller in a naive fixed effects model. In the Bayesian model, it augments that estimate less with the population as you're more certain about it. So think about, again, back to your Paris and Berlin cafes. Um, if you initially visited the Berlin cafe a ton of times, and then when you just, the first time you visit the Paris cafe, you have a lot of confidence that it's like that Berlin cafe. And so you're augmenting your expectations just a little bit with your initial experience from the Paris cafe. But eventually you've got so much data from the Paris cafe that the population, the average in the population of cafes doesn't matter at all. You don't augment hardly anything. And that'll happen in these models too. Eventually, you can get so much data per cluster that the population does nothing for you, right? or almost nothing for you. Nevertheless, if you have some clusters which have very little data, those clusters with a lot of data are going to help you a ton to estimate them, right? because they give you information about the population. Does this make some sense? Uh, and of course, the medium tanks are intermediate. Notice also that the further um, the tank is from the population mean, the more it moves towards the mean. That's because, remember, there's a distribution of effects, and the more extreme estimates are less likely, according to what we've learned, about the distribution in the population, its mean invariance. Uh, so they're less plausible, according to the posterior distribution, and they get shrunk more uh, further in, out of the tail uh, of that epistemological distribution. Does that make some sense? Um, so this is like uh, 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 any sort of situation where if you have... You know, you put like three tadpoles in a tank, say, um, uh, notice that we've got a three tanks here on the far left where all the tadpoles survived, right, where the blue dots are up at one. Um, that's probably sampling variation, right? You wouldn't want to infer from that that all, if we put 100 tadpoles in those, they would all live. Uh, probably there's still a chance of death in those tanks. Uh, but since there are so few tadpoles, they all got lucky. Uh, nature flipped their coins, and they all came up heads, right, which means live, I guess. Nature's coin, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Uh, bigger tanks, you don't see, I mean, there is one large tank that's like that, but bigger tanks, you see fewer of those because sampling variation gives you extreme outcomes like that less often. Um, but they get shrunk away from that because the model's skeptical that there are any tanks that have 100% chance of surviving, right? Because there, yeah, there aren't very many in the population. Um, so yeah, here's where I think I got to this slide actually already by accident answering your questions. Um, you do have to be careful with uh, comparing the intercept alpha uh, in a varying effects model to an intercept name the same thing in a fixed effects model because they don't mean the same thing now. Um, in these varying effects model, alpha is a feature of this population, statistical population you're estimating, right? It's it's not uh, an empirical feature of any particular unit in the data. Um, it's, and so nearly always what happens, and this is why you want to watch out for it, is that the standard deviation of this intercept parameter um, in a varying intercept model is going to be a lot wider. Why? Because it, it co-varies massively. It's highly correlated in the posterior distribution with all of the intercepts and with the standard deviation which means there's just a bunch of combinations of alpha and all the alpha tanks and the, and the standard deviation sigma that, that are equally plausible given the data. 
And so if you just look at the marginal posterior distribution, like in the graph in the bottom of this slide, for alpha, which is shown in blue in the, in the varying intercept model, it'll look like you don't know where it is. Uh, but if you take that posterior distribution and add it to the samples from the posterior distribution of the individual alpha tanks, you'll show that the standard deviation is a lot narrower than that. You actually know a good idea where each tank is. So this is, this is that accident that I've been harping on you guys forever about most mar marginal posteriors. They lie. They're lying dogs. Right? If you look at one, if the predictions depend upon a bunch of parameters, then you got to combine them to see what your certainty is like. Uh, right? It's like I had that, I've had a bunch of examples like this, so I don't need to, to go over it too long. This is a weird thing because as soon as we get to varying slopes, the same thing will happen, but then it's beta coefficients that exhibit this, and then people will add, use the varying effects model, and suddenly their slope is not significant, and they freak out, and then they go back to the fixed effects model, right, because they want to publish. And uh, this is completely the wrong inference. Uh, the slope can be just as important or even more important. It's just that you're only looking at part of the effect now. Uh, and that's what you want to think about here. You're only looking at part of the intercept. And that this part of the intercept has a wide standard deviation. And the other parts might too if you look at it marginally. When you combine them, it's narrower because they're negatively correlated with one another, uh, like a lot of these things are. Uh, this is something you'll have to do pair plots to figure out, maybe. But... Uh, uh, this is the guts of the machine, and this is why people like this course, right? They make you open it up and fight with the carburetor and uh, see how the engine runs, right? Um, does this make some sense? Yeah. You just have to be careful about that. You should expect this to happen. It's a different parameter. It means something different, so you can't really compare it uh, to what it is. Just because it's named the same thing it doesn't mean it's the same kind of parameter. Okay. So, summary of shrinkage. Um, varying effects estimates shrink towards the mean, which in this case we called alpha. The further from the mean, you get more shrinkage. Uh, because the model is less skeptical. It, it, it thinks it's more plausible that those extreme values are due to sampling variation and the finite amount of data per cluster rather than some genuine feature of that tank in this case. Um, uh, so as, also as a consequence, if there's less data in some particular cluster, a tank in this case, you get more shrinkage because uh, it's more plausible that sampling variation explains its position, right? And so you need more information from the population to get a better estimate. And uh, if more data, likewise, you get less shrinkage. Um, yeah, hands back there. So I just want to repeat. Uh, what you That's said, okay. But um, you say it shrinks towards the, the intercept in a very effects model is the mean of the intercepts of each tank in this case. I, am, I don't know. I didn't quite understand that statement. But um, it could be right. The intercept variable um, alpha. alpha that you get in average of the population. population of alpha. Yes. Is that weighted by the size of mm -hmm. alpha? Yes, and the sample size imbalance is all taken account of automatically. Yep. Okay. Exactly. That is, again, the, this is the awesome thing about Bayesian inference is it means you don't have to be clever. Which uh, is like, I mean, usually people advertise it like it's a super clever thing to do, but actually I want to advertise it like it's the opposite. If you feel like me, like you're not clever, and nature is a lot smarter than you, then what, what you can do is you can make assumptions. You can say, you know, I think these things come from some common distribution. I mean, the variation in log of survival of these tanks is not infinite, right? So it makes sense to try and estimate it from the data. Once you make that assumption that it's something and assign a parameter to it, the model takes care of all of the logic, the logical implications of imbalance amongst the tanks and everything. Uh, just because its probability theory is counting up logically all the ways these different things could happen, additional on our assumptions. You don't have to even be able to do the counting yourself anymore because we have clever robots to do it for us. Uh, that's a wonderful thing, um, I think. It's why rockets fly. It is. Maybe that's bad, though. <laughs> Maybe there's a rocket ever do something good for humanity. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we won't have that conversation, but some other time we will. <laughs> other questions before I move on? No? It's how we conserve endangered species, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's another, another conversation to have sometime after a beer. Um, okay. So this is often called pooling as well. And... Um, Shrinkage is the, is, the, is the phenomenon of the comparison between them. The general statistical phenomenon is called pooling. Uh, this, this poster here is just to help you remember it. Jokes help you remember things. Pool or the terrorists win. Right? Use the motivate Americans to do anything. And uh, so what's going on here is we're pooling information from all the tanks into a population. And then information is getting doled out by the Bayesian inference, by the probability theory, to tanks where it's needed most to improve the individual estimates. And all this is done simultaneously because there's a joint probability distribution of all the parameters. Um, so each tank informs estimates of the other tanks. Uh, 
this just goes back to the the amnesia thing uh, that on Thursday that I launched this lesson with. Um, uh, this is a result of just remembering information uh, and learning as you go. Um, so that if you remember the last cafe you were at, uh, that gives you a prior for the new cafe you arrive at, but you quickly update that prior with your experience from the new cafe. But wait, the order you, you visited the cafes in is irrelevant. It's arbitrary. So you must now simultaneously use your new data from this cafe you just visited to update the previous posterior from the other cafe. These models do exactly that. Uh, and they do it without you having to be clever enough to know to do it. Uh, you just define the assumption. And what we get from this is um, better estimates. So, and this is a famous thing in statistics. Uh, so I said there's a non-Bayesian version of this uh, because there's, there's this tradition of using multi-level models in, in frequent statistics. They call it empirical Bayes uh, because the estimators end up coming out to look very much like the Bayesian solutions, but they were derived completely differently. The person usually associated with this, and rightly so, is Charles Stein. Um, recently celebrated his 90-somethings birthday. I think he's, he's emeritus at Stanford. And uh, Stein has this very famous paper in statistics, and only in statistics, <laughs> uh, with this horrible title called Inadmissibility of the Usual Estimator for the Mean of a Multivariate Normal Distribution. Uh, and what this means is, this is just a claim about pooling, and this was, is called Stein's Paradox, which is that you can do better than the mean if you want to predict the future. And you do better in this very paradoxical way by using data from other clusters in the data. You can make better predictions about the cluster of interest by polluting it with data from the other clusters. And this strikes people as really strange. Uh, a commonplace use of this is in baseball statistics. You're trying, to, you're trying to figure out which rookie you want to bid for in baseball teams. And this is all the analytics of baseball are really well worked out, right? And uh, uh, so do you use just that player's data, that finite sample, uh, maybe they're just an outlier who did really well in training camp. Uh, and so you get some skepticism from the population distribution of rookies about how much you should pay for this person. Um, that said, there are some people who are truly outliers, and famously so in baseball. Uh, and so pooling can hurt you in those cases where there are true outliers who are super extreme, like orders of magnitude out. I think baseball doesn't furnish as many examples of that, but there's a famous case in cricket. I don't know if anybody here has ever played cricket. It's a strange sport. It's very entertaining, though. And they play it in the other Commonwealth nations, and they're crazy about it in other places. But there's this famous Australian cricketer um, whose name I forget for the moment. I'll blurt it out in a second. If anybody here is Australian, you know what I'm talking about? I, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember the name. Yeah, it'll be blurted out if you remember. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I can't remember it's either. Video games after him. Yo, yeah, exactly. He's huge. You go into Australian homes, too. People just have portraits of the guy in their house. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a national hero, and he was an order of magnitude, I'm not kidding you, better than any other cricketer who's ever lived worldwide. He's just amazing. Like, nearly 100% wicked average, if you can call it that. They call it batting, actually. But, um, and just extraordinary. You don't want to pool those guys. But you need a lot of data about them before you're sure that they truly are outliers uh, from these models. Um, the other players are just perfectly Gaussianly distributed, and then there's this Australian guy who's just, like, truly way out there anchoring the end of the scale. I can't remember his name. Bradman. John Bradman. Yeah. yeah, Bradman. There it is. No, really, I was in Australia a long time ago, and it was this weird guy in everybody's house. I'm like, who is this guy? Oh, you don't know the Bradman? <laughs> <laughs> and they call it the Bradman. He's <laughs> <laughs> a big deal. Now, you look, read his Wikipedia page. Pretty amazing athlete. He's really extraordinary. Um, and, and hated being famous, too. He's an interesting guy. Anyway. Um, so I just put this up here to give you some of the history. Uh, Stein's paradox is interesting. And there's this great paper uh, which gives you some of the culture of statistics around it by Efren and Morris from 1977 called Stein's Paradox in Statistics. Uh, an internet search will find you a PDF copy of this paper really quick. Uh, and it's a cool paper, and they, they look at some empirical examples where these pooling estimators help you a lot to get better estimates. Here's a, here's a famous case, um, a study of toxoplasmosis in El Salvador. Um, I think this was done in the early 70s, and um, more and less data in different places. So it's this classic hazard in estimation. There's imbalance in sampling. So you can't just take naive averages across things. And, and, but you really care about the variation, too. You want good, precise estimates for every locale because toxoplasmosis varies a lot geographically across uh, El Salvador. So when you look at these pooling estimators, here's a, this is the way they're often plotted. I'll explain this to you real quick uh, uh, just because this is a motivating example. Um, what you're looking at uh, up there on the top are the 
sort of naked estimates, raw empirical mm -hmm. estimates for each district in El Salvador, each site where they got estimates. And notice that they're scattered quite a lot. Um, that sort of shelf that's going up is showing you the standard deviation of the estimate there. And that's basically just a measure of the sample size. When the standard deviation is high, there wasn't a lot of data from that place, from that town. When it's small, there was a lot of data. So urban centers have very small standard deviations because you're really sure what the rate is there. Small villages, you're not quite sure because you can only sample a few adults. Uh, so then what happens in the bottom is we get what are called the Jane Stein estimators. For the sake of this discussion, you can think of those as the posterior means you get from the Bayesian multilevel model. Well, this is a frequentist analysis that arrives at the same logic. And you notice that they are pooled towards the mean, the inferred mean. And the more extreme ones shrink more uh, because they're implausible. And shrinkage is also proportional to the sample size. That is, So this one that's far out on the left had a very large standard deviation because it was a small locale, and they got a really extreme estimate, it gets shrunk to be much more reasonable. And what we know from simulation and, and iterative science is that this improves estimates on average uh, because the scatter, a lot of the scatter on the top part of this graph is just sampling variation and imbalance in data across sites. Does this make some sense? Um, so all of this is really about overfitting again. Overfitting is the specter of our lives. And um, think back to Ulysses' compass from however many weeks ago that we did this. And I made fun of Occam's razor, right? Because Occam's razor only gives you advice in one direction. If you had two models that had equally good predictions, and one was simpler than the other, then choose a simpler one. That's Occam's razor, basically. Occam's razor doesn't give you any advice of trading off predictive accuracy and complexity, which is unfortunately the problem we usually have. So that's my Ulysses compass uh, uh, idea, is you need to trade things off. You've got to choose which, which hazard to sail closer to. And ideally, you'd like to navigate between them and not kill any sailors, right? Um, so this is trading off um, overfitting and underfitting. One way you can think about this is that varying effects are uh, adaptive regularization. So they're solving the overfitting problem. Right? Remember, we, we use regularizing priors because we don't like to overfit. That's the way I introduce them. These are, these are just regularizing priors, but they learn the prior. They learn the amount of regularization from the data. Uh, that's what they do. So you can view them legitimately that way as well. Uh, and this is why they do a good job, because they learn, they tune the compass uh, from the data itself. So in reasonably sized samples, you get a lot of information about how skeptical you should be, given the variation across units. And this helps us to avoid overfitting. So you can think about... If you had a model in which you didn't even distinguish among the different clusters and you just used the grand mean to make a prediction for every cluster. So this would be like taking that, that red line that I had on the tadpole tank graph, which is just a naive total mortality rate across all the tanks, and use that to predict each tank. This is maximum underfitting, right? You're doing a terrible job of predicting every tank, but it's the simplest model possible. Yeah? Uh, the other end is if a fixed effects model. Um, the amnesiac model, uh, is maximum overfitting because now you only get to use the data from each individual tank, ignoring all the data from the others. It's a complex model. Uh, it maximally overfits uh, because you're, you're trying to estimate a whole batch of parameters with tiny bits of data for each. Uh, and the, the regularizing, adaptively regularizing model, the varying effects model, uh, tries to learn how far between these extremes it should be. And it tries to learn that from the data. Uh, now, it's not magic. If your assumptions are bad, it'll be bad. Uh, but in most cases, simulation and science tells us it does a better job. So that's why I argue uh, this deserves to be the default form of regression, which doesn't mean you have to do it. It just means it would be better to start with the idea that you should do it and then back out of it when it turns out you don't need it uh, rather than the other way around. So really quick, I'm not going to spend much time on this because this is a section of the book that I think you could walk through. Um, I wanted to prove to you that they're more accurate, so I give you all the code in the book to actually simulate this over and over again if you want. Simulate tadpole mortality, and then do the varying effects model. What's good about the simulation is you know the true mortality rates for each tank, right? And you know everything because you plugged it in there. But your model doesn't. Uh, from a model's perspective, um, uh, and, and a, a bunch of people wrote to me uh, uh, over the weekend about the... Um, Zero inflated models because uh, I rightly did a horrible job. They rightly wrote to me because I did a horrible job explaining that. And the simulation exercise there didn't change anything. It was meant to be a bonus, but I understand now it just confused people. And so I'll try to do better in the future. But the whole point is uh, with the simulation is to validate that it's working. And you can only do that when you know the true parameter values, right? The data to the model, 
uh, data looks the same. It has no idea. Models are stupid, right? They're just little golems. And they have no idea the difference between dummy data and real data. It all looks the same to them. So it's a true test of the model, the model can learn. Um, so here's a case. I encourage you to look through the notes on this uh, where we simulate 60 ponds now and um, with a range of sample sizes, 5, 10, 25, and 35 tadpoles in each of uh, 15 ponds at, at those sizes. Um, and in this case, there's a bunch of ponds. I'm only showing you the first 10. Uh, all these are small ones, so only five tadpoles to start with. There's some true log odds of mortality in that tank, which has been come from a population. And uh, then we simulate a number surviving from a binomial distribution, right? Some of these, they all die, poor things, and some of them, boo, party, they all live. And uh, uh, some of that variation is due to the variation in these rates of survivorship, right? Um, then we get estimates from different models. And there's the no pool estimate, which is your fixed effects model, the amnesiac model, and you'll notice we get extreme ones, right? When they all survive, they, the estimate is that it's 100% probability of survival. That's pretty naive, right? You can see uh, that's overfitting. And then there's the uh, partial pooling estimates, which are the varying effects estimates, and then we have the true ones. This is just the logistic transform of that. And then we can compare the accuracy. So let me quickly show you uh, what happens. And this is one particular simulation, but it's a representative one. I'm not trying to lie to you here. Uh, but I give you all the code to do this as many times as you like. Sit down with your favorite beverage and just run it over and over again if you like. You'll see a bunch of tadpoles virtually die, and you'll learn something about statistics. Um, so uh, what I'm plotting on this across the bottom is all our ponds. There are 60 of them. Um, and then the absolute error uh, is on the vertical. That's the difference between uh, the absolute value of the difference between the parameter estimate, the posterior mean of the parameter, and the true value, which we know because we faked all these tests. Um, and blue are the raw proportions, the fixed effects estimates, the maximally overfitting ones. And the open ones, again, are the multi-level estimates. These bars on here show you the averages, so you don't have to like squint at the cloud of points to figure out what's going on. So the blue is the average raw error. Uh, for the tanks in this category, and the dashed black line is the average multi-level error. So what I want you to see, first of all, is the average multi-level error is lower. It does better, because the pooling estimates have done better in the simulation trials. And this is nearly always true, especially for small tanks. Why? Because there isn't a lot of data from them. So you can get a lot of information to help you tame down the overfitting from exploiting the population distribution. Make some sense? Uh, at larger tanks, you get almost nothing. So large tanks, uh, there are 15 large tanks in the sample as well, over there with 35 tadpoles in them. When you have 35 tadpoles, you get a really good estimate of the actual probability of survival in the tank, or the pond in this case. Um, and so there's almost no difference. There is, the pooled estimates are still a little tiny bit better, right? It is below it, but almost nothing. Uh, and this is a general feature. When you've got a lot of data per cluster, um, varying effects models don't do a lot for you, unless you care about the population too, right? Uh, and I'm going to come back to that point later today. Right? Even if you don't get any benefits from shrinkage, you might want to learn about the population so you can extrapolate to new clusters, right? different than these. Uh, so you may want to learn about variation anyway. And then the sizes in between are intermediate. Right? Uh, the benefits diminish as the amount of data goes up, but there's information flowing from the right-hand side of the graph to the left-hand side of the graph right? out of those to improve the estimates on the left. Yeah, fine. So I'm just trying to Um, so the question is, is it in the multi-level model, is, is alpha a weighted mean? Yes, uh, but it, it's weighted. So in the simplest, like Gaussian Gaussian models, which this is not an example of, um, there's a formula for it. I'll show you how to do the weighting. And in, um, so if you dig into the literature much, you'll find that formula. And what you do is you weight it by something called the precision, which is the inverse variance, the inverse of the variance in that cluster. Uh, that probably didn't help, but that's what you're that's what you're waiting by. So it's like think of it this way: if if you've got a very precise estimate for a particular cluster, then it, it's a big weight in when you try to figure out the population. What's tricky about this is that information is flowing in both directions because it's a joint probability distribution, right? The the individual estimates for each thing now depend upon the population estimate, but the population estimate depends upon them. Uh, and so, yeah, like try to do that in your head. Uh, that's why we have math. Uh, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, 
as a first-order intuition that it's a weighted mean, that's correct. But there's a second-order intuition is that there's information flowing in both directions. So it's not exactly that. Did that, did that help? Yeah. Uh, okay. So you just made a comment about you might want to learn something from the population. What about if you have a categorical variable that you don't think it's, it's fixed in the sense that maybe it's an experimental condition, five conditions, and you don't think of the population as a condition in this case? Would you do the same kind of thing with that, or would you not? Um, question was, what if, you're, what if you're categorical thing, you know, like you have an index that goes over different treatments? Uh, um, I, most cases, no, I wouldn't do it, because there's this issue of, in, in statistics, there's this term called exchangeability, uh, which basically, in the simplest case, means are the subscripts irrelevant, right? Uh, can you just exchange the ordering among them, and it doesn't change the information content at all? In those cases, pooling is almost always an aid when you have exchangeable things. And you could code your treatments so that they're exchangeable, but you probably know more about them, right? There probably are actual interventions you know something about that explain them. If you just wanted to measure the variation across the treatments, then yes, by all means, just number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, plug them into a varying intercepts model. You're, what you're doing is a hierarchical analysis of variance there across the treatments. And that's okay, but I bet you could do better. Uh, so, I mean, I often start with, even when I've got a bunch of predictor variables, I often start with just a varying intercepts model with all the different kinds of clusters in the model. I'll show you how to do more than one cluster in a little bit. Um, just to figure out where the action is in the data, at what level is the variation, and that's just, it's a Bayesian analysis of variance with shrinkage. Uh, and it's, it's often really useful as a first go. But then, you know, your experiment tells you the model structure you're aiming for, so then you start adding in predictors. And you could probably do better by saying, like, treatment three was hot. <laughs> right, so there's a temperature proxy that works better, or something like that, than, than the pool. But that said, when we get to varying slopes, I bet this question will come back. And then you will ask it, right? Uh, okay, was that a hand? Yeah. That was auto -varying. Okay, that was like sign language or something. Sorry. Good? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, let's add more intercepts. Um, and this is called. Uh, so often there's more than one type of cluster in the data. In the tadpole data, it's the simplest sort of model we can construct. The only real structure to the data is that um, there are different uh, tanks or ponds that tadpoles are found in. But often the raw observations can be found in different kinds of categories at the same time. This is a routine thing. So I want to give you an example of this using a data set you're already familiar with and show you how to specify what's called the cross-classified varying intercept model where you you partition the variation in the data across the different kinds of clusters. You're learning about the population of effects at all of them at once, and you get shrinkage in all of them. Uh, in other words, it's, it's still, it's adaptive regularization, if you prefer to think of it that way. You're regularizing priors on offsets for different kinds of categories in your data, and the model learns how much it's to regularize them from the variation that's present. So let's think back to the chimpanzees data. Uh, there were pulls. The raw observation is a pull, right? A zero, one pull of a left-hand lever. And those are found in chimpanzees. So we can do a varying intercepts model in chimpanzees. Uh, we'll do that. Um, uh, but there are also experimental blocks. And experimental blocks were sessions in which they brought in the chimpanzees and had them do a few things. So the chimpanzees get bored of this pretty fast. And there's only so many food items they want, I think. And uh, uh, so blocks, since they happen at different times on different days, uh, there may be... Uh, uh, unmeasured covariance that affect the behavior of all the chimps. Like, they all had a fight right before they brought them in to do the experiment. So one of the blocks is you know, everybody's sulking or something like that, right? And this happens. Uh, it really does. Weather and all kinds of unmeasured things can mess around with your experiments. And so it's, there's a long tradition of, in, in biology and the social sciences of thinking about experimental block, temporal correlations that arise from unmeasured covariance. Um, so we want to do both of these things as well. Uh, what's what's Interesting about this is that it's not nested, and, um, and in general, it doesn't need to be. Uh, every chimpanzee is found in every block, uh, so they're, they're all cross-classified. It's not a hierarchical data structure. If it were hierarchical, the model would look the same. Uh, it really would. Sometimes software wants to make you put it in, in different codes, but they're actually the same model, uh, nearly always underneath. Um, so here's what it looks like. Uh, well, first, let's just do varying intercept model on chimps to ease you into this. This is just like the tadpole model, except we've got some, the linear model is a little bit more expansive. And I'd like to use this chance to introduce you to another common convention for coding these, where we take 
grand alpha now out of the regularizing prior and we put it into the linear model? It's exactly the same model. Why? Because Gaussian distributions, if you subtract the mean from them and just put them over zero, uh, as long as you add the mean back in at some point, it makes the same predictions. Right? You can just add, subtract the mean from a Gaussian distribution whenever you want, or additive like that. Uh, so you can factor alpha out um, and put it up here, same posterior distribution as if you put it inside. Um, so just so you'll sometimes see them written this way, um, and as you'll see a little bit in a moment, uh, there's this doing it this way can, can pre prevent a kind of mistake uh, uh, of non-identifiable models. Um, so we get adaptive regularization on actors, this variation across actors, um, and then we, we estimate the variance for them. Does this make sense? Just like the tadpole model. Yeah. Sorry, quick question. So I've done this both ways before, and I, everything moves. All the intercepts shift. Yeah, but because they mean something different now because they don't have the mean in them. But if you add the mean back to them, they're the same posterior okay. distributions. But you're absolutely right. When you do it this way, the alpha actors are offsets from alpha. When you do it the other way, they already include alpha, so you don't have to add alpha in. But you're right. They absolutely do. Um, same predictions. Okay, uh, so fit this model, there are no surprises. Um, I'm just highlighting for you uh, alpha sub actor uh, bracketed by actor um, uh, for, for the uh, index uh, uh, in the actor variable in that case. Um, here's the cross-classified model. Um, again, highlighting in blue the new bits. Uh, so up in the linear model, we add an alpha sub block. Now, now for each block, for the case I that corresponds to, block is an index variable. There were, I think, six blocks in uh, this experiment, so six daily sessions in which they ran all the trials over. And uh, so whereas alpha sub actor is an offset for that actor, all the actor's observations get offset by that amount, uh, the log odds do, um, every observation in a particular block is going to get an offset now as well. And we can combine these uh, in the linear model. Um, and we make another regularizing prior for the alpha blocks, and we learn how regularizing it should be by giving it a free parameter, sigma sub block, that we're going to estimate from the data, just like before. So you can have as many of these within pragmatic reason as you like. <laughs> Whatever your, your cluster structure is, and it can be really complicated. So the, the traditional example in the social sciences is you have, you have questions in exams, in students, in classrooms, in schools, in districts, in states, in countries. And people analyze that model all the time. It's a very important model right, for educational reform. And it's, there is a lot of varied intercepts <laughs> and slopes uh, in those models. We'll get, we'll get the slopes in a moment. Uh, but that's what it does, is there's a lot of cross-classification right, at different levels. Does that make some sense? Uh, right, because there are different students that are all taking the same test, right? But not all students take all the same tests, and not all tests have the same questions in them. And, uh, but you can, so you're figuring out how much variation in the outcomes are due to these different components uh, with a model like this. It's a fancy analysis of variance with shrinkage. Uh, and students also transfer schools, which makes it fun. Right? And classrooms and all these things. You guys with me for a moment? Yeah, question. So, just so, um, do your alpha actors and alpha blocks aren't necessarily your estimates won't end up being necessarily normal. Um, right. End up centered at zero, or is that not also not necessarily? Not necessary? necessarily. If you just take like the posterior means for the alpha actors and average them, no, there's no guarantee it'll be zero. Uh, Should it be close? Not necessarily, because you could have some outlier for whom there's a lot of data, and then the empirical, then the posterior, the mean of the posterior means won't even be close to zero, right? You could have a Bradman. There could be a Bradman chimp. In fact, in this data, we do have the Bradman, the chimp that always pulled left, <laughs> right? Oh, well, that's the wrong thing to associate with the Bradman. <laughs> the Bradman did everything right. <laughs> that chimp, well, who's to say that chimp was doing anything wrong, really? <laughs> but, uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, this is, I am very sympathetic with this being confusing. Uh, and it is, it is weird, but they're, the epistemological assumption about the distribution of effects is, is used to improve those estimates, but it doesn't, it doesn't force them to look out, uh, especially if there's imbalance in sampling or you've got something that's particularly extreme. It doesn't do shrinkage. It moves them, but they can, they can be very skewed. Um, in fact, in this data set, they are. This is a good example because 
Uh, most of them are right-handed, and then you've got those few individuals who really strongly prefer the left lever. And follow-up question. So yeah. the shrinkage is happening on the logic scale? Yes, it is, on the parameter scale. Yeah. Okay, so um, how do you fit this? Uh, just as you might think, um, you add it into the map to stand code, add a term in the linear model, um, add another regularizing prior for block and um, sigma block. The only caveat here is Stan doesn't like any variable called block, so I've had to call this block underscore num. I don't know, block is a reserved word in Stan. I, this always tricks me because I always come back to this data set named block and then it's like syntax error. You can't use the word block. Well, excuse me, use the word block. <laughs> um, there's another one too, I think dist. Uh, you can't use dist either for distance. Uh, so anyway, eventually Stan will train me not to use their reserved words, but for the moment. Anyway, it'll tell you. You'll get a syntax error and it'll say you can't use that word now. That's uh, <laughs> literally what it says. No. Um, okay, so highlighting both of them now, you've got uh, two sets of varying intercepts. They're both in the linear model. Um, and it's nice to have the regularizing prior centered on zero so that you don't accidentally make two alpha parameters and then can't identify either of them. Right, remember that? That could happen. Uh, you with me, guys? All right, so what happens very quickly? Um, you can compare the posterior distributions for both of the sigmas now. And uh, they're both on the log odds scale, so they're comparable. Um, lots of variation among actors. We saw that before. I'm showing you in the graph at the bottom here, the black contour is the marginal posterior distribution for actors. And uh, that's a standard deviation about two. This is on the logit scale, so that's a lot. Uh, that'll cover, if you sample a normal distribution mean and zero and standard deviation two, with a, you'll, you'll get log odds that cover the whole probability space, basically, once you transform back to probability scale. It's a lot of variation. Because remember, log odds of four is basically always, right? Uh, so two standard deviations out is 95%. So it, add a, you can easily, you know, 95% of the samples from this implied prior will be between minus four and four. That's a big range. Uh, so chimps vary a lot. And you knew that before from the data. Um, there's not a lot of variation among blocks. Instead, notice that it's crowded up against the boundary. There's some evidence, there's certainly some variation among blocks uh, because the chimps did behave just from sampling variation, if nothing else. They behave differently on average across blocks. But not much. Most of the action here is individual handedness preferences. And then uh, one of the treatment effects, the side of the table with more food on it, was more attractive. And that still holds up in the model, uh, even with all these other things in it. Um, and you can just see it if you do these uh, dot charts. Uh, up here in the top part of the dot chart, you're seeing the actor estimates, right? Uh, these are all offsets from zero, because they haven't got alpha plugged into them yet. Um, so which is another is a chance to say, you want to add samples of alpha to each of those, um, they're negatively correlated with one another, so those, those error bars are going to shrink uh, when you get the individual frequency estimates. They're, they're smaller than that. Right? There's joint uncertainty. We're only looking at cross-sections. Remember, we had hazards like this all the time. Um, and then the blocks, you can just see, uh, there's not a lot going on with blocks. There was this one first block where there was a little bit uh, of uh, uh, pulling the right-hand lever more, and then the last block, a little bit more pulling the left-hand lever, but yeah, there's nothing really to get excited about there, which is good news. It means the experiment was good, <laughs> right? You don't want block variation. Does this make sense? Yeah, question. The, the alpha there, the, just the A by itself, that's the population, right? Um, yes. All right, because I thought in a previous slide you had said that it was the grand mean. We're not seeing the grand mean. We're not seeing the grand mean. Right? Okay. It's the grand mean of the statistical population. There was another slide where I, just, I tried to distinguish between alpha and the grand mean. So if you just naively average across all the chips here, uh, actually, in this experiment, it's going to be really similar because everything's balanced. This is a nice experiment, and all the chips pull the levers exactly the same number of times in every block. Uh, so they should be really similar, actually. I don't, they won't be exactly the same, but they'll be pretty similar. They'll be exactly the same because you've still got that crazy actor number two, right? Uh, and the model is pretty skeptical that most chimpanzees are going to be like that. Um, okay, with me? All right, uh, this will take some time to sink in. Um, but very quickly, let's talk about effective parameters. Remember, varying effects are um, regularizing priors. Uh, so uh, they, what shrinkage does is it, it makes the model, um, it makes those individual intercepts less able to fit the sample. And ironically, if you tune that exactly right, or not ironically, uh, paradoxically, the violation of intuition, you get better estimates when you do that for exactly the same reason as always. Overfitting is bad. 
the sample is not what you want to generalize completely from. Uh, it's a tricky issue. In this case, the sample refers to each chimpanzee uh, or each block. Uh, so let's do the quick model comparison here. Think about the model with both kinds of varying intercepts, actor and block. It has 18 parameters. Uh, it ends up with 11 effective parameters. Um, it gets to shave off about seven of them because the block parameters do almost nothing for overfitting because the standard deviation is really small. It's less than one at the posterior median. And so that's like putting an adapt that's like putting a regularizing prior on all those with the standard deviation like 0.2. Uh, and so they can't move, right? They're stuck. It's a very informative prior, but it was learned from the data in this case. Make some sense? Meanwhile, the actor, the learned prior for the actors is looser. It has a standard deviation like 2.5 or something and uh, uh, at the median. Uh, and so it's a lot looser. Um, so the model with, uh, you lose seven effective parameters in the actor and block model, and they're mostly block parameters. The actor model alone loses fewer as a proportion. It goes down from 11 to 8 because they're not redundant parameters. Uh, there's, there's less regularization going on because we, there's more variation among actors, and we need those parameters. Um, statistically, this is a tie. This is what I want to show you. The WIC values are off by one point. Never get excited about that. Uh, they're the same model. And they'll make the same predictions because the block parameters don't do anything to prediction uh, at all. So this is a case where what have you learned? You always learn more from comparing models in a set than selecting one. Uh, it would be fine to fall back to the actor-only model because it's simpler. Um, but if you want to be able to say, yeah, we added block in, you know, and it makes exactly the same predictions. Uh, and, and I know why, because there's almost no variation, posterior variation across blocks. The caveat here about this adaptive regularizing priors, of course, is that there's not a particular value that's getting plugged in as sigma. There's a whole distribution of sigmas, and all the other estimates are averaging over that uncertainty as well. That's, that's what's great about the Markov chains and everything. But still, heuristically, you can think about it as if you're like plugging in the posterior median, and it'll help you think about it. But it's really plugging in the whole distribution and then averaging it all up, the cascade of information up. Does that make some sense? Yeah, it just makes a little bit of sense. This is enough. I think it's plausible that no human being really understands probability theory, but we develop like motor habits <laughs> that let us successfully use it, right? But, you know, we need the mental prosthetic of the computer to actually do this stuff. If we could actually really conceptualize probability theory in our heads, we wouldn't need the pencil and paper and computers and everything else, right? We're, we're the master of this thing, but it, it's a prosthetic. We can do thinking that we can't do for ourselves. That's why we need machines. Uh, that's just like trowels. Everything else, uh, I gestured to the archaeologist. So you don't know what a trowel is. <laughs> this is <laughs> which is, yes, he's like, it's that. <laughs> and, uh, or, you know, any number of tools. They do things for us that we can't do for ourselves, but we make the things for a purpose. Um, and they're, they're prosthetics. And these are mental prosthetics. Uh, they help us think. They expand our short-term memory. And they, they, in these cases, I think Bayesian inference is a way of seeing the implications of your assumptions in the light of data. And it's invaluable for that. And I find it humiliating all the time because it tells me my intuitions are pretty awful. Uh, but I value that. Right? It's, that's what science is about. It's about the profession of humiliating yourself in public. <laughs> and, and, and kind of get over the insecurity of that for a while. And I'm serious. I am. This is like one of the rare cases where I'm not only joking about things. Um, OK. Let's talk in the last uh, uh, 15 minutes here about um, posterior predictions. And that'll set us up on Thursday to do varying slopes, uh, where we extend all of this logic to any kind of parameter, right? So even the effects of treatments, uh, we can do pooling there and do way better. And we'll do that on Thursday. Um, so let's focus instead on um, this, this gnarly issue now of what we might do with estimates of the variation in the population. Even if we had tons of data per cluster, we're still estimating that alpha and that sigma. And that gives us that inference about the variation. So now imagine you want to generalize to some new tadpole ponds. You don't get to use the alphas from the tadpole ponds in this model because those ponds aren't present next year. They've all dried up and all the tadpoles have been eaten and there are going to be some new ponds and tanks. Uh, or there are going to be some new students in some new classrooms, uh, whatever it is you're clustering on. Uh, some new chimpanzees and some new blocks. Uh, but the variation you've estimated among those effects that you've estimated from these data can be used in forecasting. Uh, and it's invaluable for that. And this, this issue is subtle. Uh, it's a subtle one. But with multi-level models, the issue of posterior prediction now depends upon you choosing what's called a level of focus. Uh, what sorts of parameters you get to use in forecasting depend upon what you're trying to forecast. And if you're trying to forecast the same cluster, the same chimpanzees, the same tadpole 
it makes sense to use all those individual alpha <coughs> actors or alpha tanks from the varying intercept model because the identities are persistent. So in poli sci, this is nearly always what they get to do because nation states aren't born and die all that fast in the life of a single human. They sometimes do. I mean, I, I was I was born in Germany during the Cold War, so I remember there used to be a wall there. <laughs> and at some point when I was in high school, that came down, and it was a big deal, and new nations were formed, and you know all this stuff happened. But this is a rare event, mainly. <laughs> and uh, so in poli sci, they can you know fit a model on the features of the political systems of particular nations or segments of nations, and then they get to use those varying intercepts in predicting next year's data for forecasting. It makes sense because the categories, the clusters, are persistent. Does this make sense? Uh, in biology, I assert this is rarely the case, and in other aspects of social science, it also may not be the case. It depends. Um, uh, but it, in the same data set, you still might want to do both things. Um, so if you're, if you're predicting to new clusters, then you can't use those varying, intercept, inter, uh, varying intercepts from the clusters in the sample because it wouldn't make any sense. You're not going to see that tadpole tank again, and you're not going to see that classroom again. Uh, you're not going to see that individual chimpanzee in another experiment. Um, but the variation among the, the tadpole tanks or among the actors is informative of how calibrated you might be about future predictions, right, using the other parameters. So you get to use all the other parameters, but you don't get to use the varying intercepts. Does that make sense? So I'm going to give you some examples now of different kinds of posterior predictive distributions you can generate out of this. And in the, in the book, I go through the code pretty slowly, I think, in this section. The section got like twice as long as I originally planned it to be in my page budget. I have a page budget, and I'm way over it. I think I'm 200 pages over it, actually. <laughs> but eh, it's a page. It's all virtual pages at this point. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so uh, you're going to want to sit down with this section as well. But I want to motivate it for you here in lecture and show you what the graphs look like and make sure you understand the contrast between them and what they mean. Uh, so that you know when you want to do them. Often you might want to do them all for a study because they tell you different things. And there's no perfect way to present and communicate the uncertainty in your inferences to the audience. I think it depends upon, well, it depends upon what you know and the audience you're speaking to. So this is this is my obligatory reminder about the horoscopes, right? So I think stats courses are partly very frustrating for everybody, students and instructors included, because we're put in a situation of trying to give you generally useful advice without knowing what you're working on. Uh, and we can use examples in class, but those examples don't be exactly like the, the data that you eventually have in hand or the problems you work on. And the nature of horoscopes is, as you know, I assume you know, is that they can only seem plausibly useful because they're hopelessly vague. Right? They say things, land things, that apply to everybody who might read them. Like your house is in Mars, and so it's a good time to make a financial investment. Okay. Might be true. <laughs> right? So... Stats advice is kind of like this in the sense that I can tell you true things. I'm not making it up like the horoscope. But, uh, well, they're not making it up either. I mean, they really believe in it. They have charts, right? So I shouldn't mind them and say, no, I mean, you know, I'm an anthropologist. I don't care about that. They believe it. Uh, I don't, but they do. They're not making it up. They're not lying. Lying is when you know it's false, right? So they're not lying. Uh, I'm not lying to you either. <laughs> so I'm telling you things that I think are true, but my advice is often bland, and I have to show you a bunch of different ways to do things because I'm trying to cover your bases. And I know that's frustrating. It's frustrating for me, and it's frustrating for you, too. Um, but that's why. This is all I can say, is that's why it's like that. So with that said, let me give you some frustrating, vague advice uh, on things. So let's take the chimpanzee example now and think about predictions for the same clusters. Uh, those would be predictions for those chimpanzees. And I'm not going to go through that here, because you know how to do that. You basically have been doing this the whole time. Varying intercepts models are no different. Uh, you can use link, and you can use sim, and it'll take account of it. If you don't have those at your disposal, you know the model. They're still just parameters. You plug them in, and you go. And if you're making predictions for individual chimps in the sample, you don't need grand alpha and grand sigma, because those are features of the population. And you're talking about this chimpanzee. Chimpanzee number two, bless her heart, always pulls the left lever, and you've got her log odds. <laughs> so you want to predict for chimpanzee number two, what lever she's going to pull next? So you get her alpha, and it's seven. And you convert that to the logistic scale, to the probability scale, and you know it says always she will pull the left lever with a tiny confidence interval. But what about new chimpanzees? Now we now you've got choices to make. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, I should have moved to this slide. First part, same actors, I just said that. Um, for new actors, this is a special kind of counterfactual prediction. Uh, it's not for, you're trying to make forecasts for um, cases which are not in the data. So it's not retrodiction like it is uh, with a lot of the examples we've done before. Um, 
now there are different choices you make. I'm going to show you uh, all three of these because they're all useful in different contexts, and they show the uncertainty in different ways. The first is what we call the average actor. You can generate predictions for the average actor, which means use alpha. Say we had an actor whose log odds of pulling the left lever was alpha, right? Now, we, there's still uncertainty because we don't know alpha for sure. Uh, we need to use that, but uh, we can use, do it that way. Talk about the average actor, and that's something to focus on. Uh, it's something that often makes sense to people, what the average statistical chimpanzee here from what we've got would be. Um, uh, then you can talk about something that's, that's slightly different called the marginal actor. Marginal actor means you sample a bunch, simulate a bunch of actors from that distribution defined by alpha and sigma, and I'll show you this. Uh, and then you average over the variation you get from it. And there's always a lot more variation there. Uh, than there is just for the average actor, right? The average actor is an av actor you're claiming is at the mean. And that's different than saying, okay, say I got a bunch of new chimpanzees, what's the spread of their of their behavior going to look like? And then you need to use sigma. Uh, and it'll, I'll show you what that looks like as well. And that's a way to appreciate how variable actors are. It's often one way to get at it. Um, and then I want to show you, I think, is a superior way to show variation across actors, which is, to just show a bunch of trend lines for a bunch of different actors and let the scatter of the trend lines substitute in for the shaded confidence regions. It's off, it's a, it communicates a lot more. It's a lot easier to see, I think. So I want to I want to motivate you to try that instead. Um, here's what the three look like. And again, apologies, the code is in the book. Uh, there are no new tricks in this code. You've seen it before, but um, uh, like with all new code, it's it's initially frightening, and you just kind of have to take your time with it and you know bug me about it. Um, on the left, we've got the average actor. What I've done here is plugging into the linear model posterior distribution of alpha. So we're still averaging over the posterior distribution. We don't know the intercepts for sure. And that generates a lot of uncertainty. But the, the treatment effects are still in here. So you see that zigzag that we had before, right? They respond when there's two units of food on the left, they go for the left, at least more often. Uh, but they don't care whether another chimpanzee is there to get the other piece of food, right? Um, and then the shaded region shows you basically the uncertainty in, well, it's, it's the uncertainty in all the parameters, uh, alpha and the beta coefficients and everything else is in there. But there's a lot more uncertainty in alpha. Um, so in the middle panel, uh, this is marginal actor. You'll see that the gray shaded region takes up nearly the whole plot now. And that's because there's a lot of variation in handedness preferences across the chimpanzees. And so when you simulate a bunch of individual chimpanzees and you get their trajectories and then you average over that, you get this predictive distribution of their, how often they, they're going to pull these levers, uh, it covers a wide range of space because you might get more actor number twos, right? Uh, they're not super common, but when you get one, uh, it causes a lot of heterogeneity in what's going to happen. Nevertheless, deep in there, there's still the Charlie Brown zigzag, right? If people, maybe I should say that because no one knows Charlie Brown. But <laughs> uh, the zigzag that used to be on Charlie Brown's shirt is in these data, right? Uh, it's, it's what happens in the treatments. And... Um, you, that's still in there, but it's hard to see. You can kind of see it at the bottom of the shaded region. So what I prefer is on the right, this is sampling 50 actors from the posterior distribution, which means for each of them, just once, we sample an alpha for them, right? Uh, and um, uh, from the posterior distribution. And then we calculate what they're going to do across all the treatments, given their fixed parameter values. And then we do it again. Sample from the posterior distribution, all the parameters we need to simulate an actor's trajectory with fixed parameter values across. 50 such simulations of that kind. Plot them up as trend lines like this. This recapitulates what's going on in the marginal actor thing quite well. You can see there's a lot of handedness bias, but you see that's not interacting very much with the zigzag pattern. The zigzag pattern is there. Uh, there's a really reliable effect of chips are attracted to the side of the table with more pieces of food on it but they don't seem to be able to figure out that they're not going to get that other piece of food, right? Or at least they're not changing their behavior on account of that. Does that make some sense? Yeah? And you'll see those those sorts of plots increasingly, I think. Yeah, question. So if I sample from the posterior, you're pulling from the map to stand or stand to map, pulling out individual uh, yeah. samples for just a, a random actor? Exactly. I'm just uh, extract samples from the model. Now you've got samples for all the parameters, and you can just take each row of samples as an actor, right? Uh, and take like just the first alpha that you get or something like that. Well, you've got to simulate them using alpha and sigma. That's the other thing. So there's a, you'll see when you look at the code, get your vector of samples from the posterior distribution of the model. Um, take the particular alpha and sigma on a particular row of samples. Draw a random normal from it, just one. There's your actor's uh, offset, 
add that to the sample for alpha on that row, right? Because that gives you their log odds, irrespective of all, when all the treatments are zero. And then you calculate the treatment effects as usual using the beta coefficient samples. So if your random intercepts are skewed, yeah, but you're drawing from the normal. So like with cricketers, it might be possible to have a really good guy. Yeah. But it's pretty unlikely that you have a terrible professional cricketer that's still a professional cricketer. Yeah. Does that mean you need to update your Well, if you make it skewed, you... then use a skewed prior, yeah. I guess. Uh, you could do that. Although with the cricketers, I mean, it is it is Gaussian empirically, except for the Bradman. Except for <laughs> yeah. Basically, they are Gaussian. It's incredible how the tyranny of Gaussian distributions. But but yeah, if you if you have good scientific reasons, and, and then this is a thought experiment where you're 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 bumping up against the friction of the epistemology and, and making claims about samples. Uh, but if you want to say it's skewed, then put that into the prior. You can use a skewed prior, or you can use a fat tail prior. You can use Cauchy distributions uh, for shrinkage too. They work fine. So T distribution is a special case of a Cauchy. You might know that. So uh, those are fat tailed. Uh, distributions that can resemble Gaussian distributions, and they work fine for shrinkage, uh, no problem. Um, and uh, they'll give you a different distribution inference about it. Um, but they, they represent a certain claim when you're fitting the data about you think that this is a really fat tailed distribution and there are a lot of outliers in the population. Um, and maybe there are. Uh, okay. Or maybe there are covariants that explain that, right, instead. Uh, it's hard to tell. But yeah, that's up to you and your science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so just. Um, I'm just wondering with those outliers, because sigma will be large because that outlier is there, right? You, you have to have, to, to fit it well, in. It depends on how many there are. Right. Uh, if, if there's only one Bradman, sigma won't be very large, and it'll shrink Bradman. Right? Unless you have the, if you have the career of Bradman's career, he won't shrink at all. But sigma will still be small because he'll have almost no effect uh, on the total distribution because there's thousands of other players in the data set. Uh, right? So you'll just get a Gaussian curve around them, basically. They'll be left out. But it all depends on the details, right? Your, so uh, to echo what I said at the beginning of the course, um, you know, it's, Bayesian inference is just logic. So it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and and lar logic's amazing because it often schools our intuitions, and our intuitions are terrible, uh, and especially about math. Uh, at least mine are. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, um, you, there's no way out of this trap of, of having to be being responsible for the model. And Bayesian inference is not a theory of making models. It's a theory of what to do with them once you got them. Uh, and that theory is basically just use logic to count up all the ways stuff could happen, conditional on your assumptions. Uh, and that's great, and it's super useful, but it doesn't, or as, as I already joked once today, it's not a substitute for science. You still gotta get your model from some better foundation, and this is the worst part of it, because I think, um, as I often say in my office, uh, lots of people, um, use statistics as a substitute for doing science, right? It's like it kind of takes over, and, the, and you'll get this kind of naive attitude. Now we've got one minute left, so people are hearing my philosophy of science. But you get this naive attitude that, like, oh, I can just come up with any hypothesis I want, and then just run it through, a, uh, run an experiment with it, and then, you know, if my p-value is less than 5%, it's true. Uh, and no, if, you're, if your hypothesis is garbage, uh, then you're always going to get some p-values less than 5%, and they'll almost all be false positives. Uh, so it's like the medical testing thing that I've harped on, and it's in the book too. It's, it's hypothesis generation is the most crucial step of science, and statistics does nothing to fix it. And if if people like in, let's say, to pick on a field, mainstream social psychology, <laughs> just, you know, which, where I think people are just like, oh, let's make a treatment where we turn on the air conditioner, and here's another treatment where we don't, and let's get people how much they like the president. And <laughs> probably, no, they're just running endless labs, just run these endless things, right? And psychologists back me up on this, right? <laughs> you guys don't, but <laughs> there are bad social psychology labs running tons of these things. And what happens then is some of those things give them asterisks, and they publish those things. But they're almost all false positives, because when almost everything you're testing is false, almost every positive indication will be a false positive. It's like... It's like these Down syndrome testing things. Paul's been uh, scouring the internet for medical statistics to make examples of these things. And, you know, so people are getting prenatal testing now for congenital disorders like Down syndrome, which is very rare. And even if the test has a very low false positive rate, most of the parents who get tested, they're, they're, the fetus doesn't have it. But they're aborting them every time they get a positive signal, pretty much, which is a tragedy, right? So lots of healthy fetuses get aborted from premedical tests because the things they're testing for, which are horrible, 
mainly don't exist in the population that people are being tested. And I think this is like true hypotheses in social psychology. They mainly don't exist. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to get angry email from social, social psychology, but bring it on. <laughs> That's all I got to say. All right. Thank you guys for your indulgence. And when we come back on Thursday, we're going to start over with multi level over dispersion.